Welcome to the FinTech Scaling Show. This podcast is sponsored by ScaleUp Consulting, helping FinTech startups create a scalable organization to support an ever-increasing demand. When you're ready to grow, reach out to us at Richard at ScaleUpConsulting.co. Now, over to the show with Richard Doherty, partner and host. Hey, what's up, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the, oh my gosh, Dave, of the FinTech Scaling Show. And, uh, you know, week in, week out, we talk to executives, entrepreneurs, founders, solopreneurs, uh, evangelists, and we, we get their insights as to how to scale up not only their business, but also themselves as they head towards their desired outcome, whatever that desired outcome may be. And Today, super excited and super uh, thrilled, actually, to have a, a good friend of mine uh, on the show, uh, Dave. Dave is, you know, a, a brilliant sales leader. He has worked in sales for, you know, a number of years. He's worked in both the corporate world and startup world. And most recently, he helped uh, an AML startup really um, find, their, find their oomph. And, uh, and not only grow, but grow exponentially. Uh, so really, really excited to welcome you onto the show today. Uh, Dave, welcome. Richard, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. And before we jump into this, I always like to give, you know, you guys and girls out there a bit of, uh, bit of insight as to what we're going to be chatting about today. And as I mentioned, Dave's got a a brilliant background in uh, in sales. He was a CRO at a number of companies in both the corporate and also startup world. So we're going to be diving into um, what it takes to sort of build that department up to make certain that, you know, it is a, a revenue generated. It can um, allow you to move your company towards where you want to move your company. And, you know, I guess before we get into those that 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 discussion, I also wanted to, you know, start this session off on a on a maybe a lighter note. And as we start the new year off, start thinking about what this year can and will bring us. And I mean, I believe right now that we are past the the information age, and we're into an age where we are connecting on a daily basis with people. We connect with them on Zoom. We connect with them on, on Slack, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Or, and also right now um, into the metaverse. We, we start to connect, connect and look at how the metaverse is going to start changing the way we as businesses and individuals work and live. So, you know, Dave, I'd like to get your view as we we kick off the the new year what is what is interesting you right now as we as we start 2022 i think it's really you know understanding that we've we've turned the page on a lot of things i mean you, you touched on some of them as far as how we're even connecting but i think it's approaching both our own teams our families and our customers and prospects uh, appreciating that that the world is much different than it used to be. Uh, the way we talk, the way we listen, the way we engage, uh, the way we prospect, uh, the way we build relationships, all of that is entirely different. So all of the, the plays and behaviors and status quo, so to speak, that we had, you know, of the previous, you know, decades <laughs> with, within our career, um, we have to be aware enough to realize that this year is different um learn what worked well in 2021 and keep an open eye to what we need to do differently in 2022 and i know that's not exactly an answer as far as what i'm interested in but i think it, it's just simply a keen awareness of staying on the front foot about what and why and where we're spending our time how we're engaging with our families, how we're engaging with our coworkers, and how we're engaging with our customers and prospects, um, because it's a it's an entirely new chapter in in business and in in everyone's lives. Now, I like it. I like that you mentioned families, you mentioned clients, you mentioned teams. Now, you know, it's it's important to 
think about all of these things. And you also mentioned that, you know, it's different now. It is different. The, the pandemic has brought, uh, brought upon, you know, a massive change in how we connect with people. And what do you think? I mean, what do you think are the skills that, you know, executives, founders and, and employees out there need to start honing to, to really make this year and the years I've come in, you know, um, prosperous for, for themselves, right? So are there skills such as, do we need to really get trained on, on Zoom and how to look at, at cameras? Do we need to um, understand how to work in, so, in, in the social world, how to use LinkedIn? Um, do we need to start thinking about how we start taking payments uh, in our business, whether it's small or large, uh, from crypto? You know, I'm just uh, I'm interested to to find out uh, what skills you think, or what skills you are looking at honing this year. Yeah, great question. I think there are certainly some very tactical, critical, foundational things like showing up on Zoom and making sure your you know head is the right size and your background is appropriate, and and these things are are correct and professional. Um, no question about that. Um, I, I, there's also, of course, foundational things that hopefully people have by now around social and engaging, uh, you know, in, in other me mechanisms and um, methods with, uh, with connectivity. Um, you know, the, the big thing is how are we connecting effectively going forward? I mean, it used to all be face to face and look, let's be real. It's just not that anymore. And it hasn't been for years, years now, right? Since March of 2020 here in the UK where I am. So there aren't trade shows. There aren't, you can't go to customers lobbies and take them out to lunch and have a dinner and, and do the things you used to do to build those relationships. So you have to be more creative and thoughtful about how you're doing that. Um, there is no perfect way. I mean, certainly web-based events is a, a big thing to focus on uh, as far as outreach. You know, I'm sorry to answer it as a, as a sales uh, <laughs> focus. Um, but the, well, you're the, in sales, right? <laughs> the, the importance of working with your marketing team, as I think about, you know, sales and how are we reaching out to customers and making sure that marketing team is working closely with sales to see what's working and what's not working. And sales can't do the same things it used to do pre-2020 and neither can marketing. And so we both need to work very closely together and be much, much more collaborative. So I think the big call out is increase the alignment and partnership with marketing uh, to ensure that you're working as, you know, as one team in one voice and, and that it's being effective, right? That you're doing, you're making data-driven uh, investments and prioritization of people's time uh, to, to drive the right outcomes. And you're not just spending money to do things or doing things because you used to do them that way, but you're being very thoughtful and purposeful about time and money uh, expended in, in 2022 with, you know, what has to happen in the new world. So I think the focus is on that improved collaboration. There's so many tools that didn't really exist at the level that they exist now, <clears throat> whether that's outreach, uh, whether that's sales loft, whether that's a whole variety of things that people just didn't use pre-2020 and the degree that they do today. You just have to be more organized and connected on that front than ever before. I get it. And, you know, marketing and sales do have to, you know, be... Um be collaborating and I think you, you hit a, a good point you know we we as as employees we as, as as people we just we can't go to the lobby we can't go and have a you know steak or a veg burger and a, and a glass of wine or a, a bottle of sparkling water it, just, it doesn't work anymore right and you know I've seen you know just on my podcast you know I, I've seen I've interviewed some brilliant minds and sometimes, you know, you know, I love them all. If you guys are listening, I love you all. <laughs> um, I feel that there's a nervousness in, in connecting on video, right? There's people are like, you know, if you're, if you listen, if you've seen this on YouTube, you'll see me like they, they, they awkward. They're like, uh, they, they can't do it. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, they're a bit awkward. Um, they are a bit twitchy and I get it, but the reality is, as Dave just mentioned, 
you know, you, you've got to hone these skills. Video, um, you know, being on, on Zoom, being on Loom, being on these different platforms, you've got to, uh, if you don't hone them, your, your future is going to look uh, a bit bleak, right? Let, let's be honest. Let, let's cut to the chase. Because, you know, the old world has gone and we, we marching into a, into a new territory. And especially now, I mean, I know it's we're slightly diverging, but especially now with the, the uprise and the yeah the uprise of the metaverse. I mean, only a couple of days ago, I was watching Ben Francis um, on on LinkedIn, and you know, yeah, he shot his first sort of video of what the metaverse looks like with Gymshark. I'm like, okay, that's interesting, right? A a product company that sells tracksuit pants is now creating the metaverse. Is now part of that metaverse, and. You know, so too as 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 Ben's doing, we need to do the same. We need to be out on out and looking at at these these upcoming trends, and also out on 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 these social platforms, consistently communicating not only to our teams, but our but our sort of our public, right? Um, and that way, we start learning and honing the skills that are required to, you know live in this digital world that we that we sort of heading towards right yeah absolutely and i think it's akin to you wouldn't ever see a a leader whether it's a sales leader or a leader in an organ, uh, organization turn their back to the audience and read a highly detailed powerpoint slide if they were physically exactly. presenting you wouldn't you can't powerpoint have... powerpoint is the, <laughs> is is a no no right i always say to my prospects i say to them by the way i'm not going to send you a powerpoint and they're like what Oh, I'm, not, I'm not sending you a PowerPoint. They're like, oh, uh, they freak out. I'm like, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do for you. Yeah. And I promise you right now, whatever I say to you, I'll put in black and white. We assign, we assign that contract, but I'm actually going to talk to you. And it sort of takes them back. They're like, okay, no PowerPoint. That, it's, it's a bit weird. But it's yeah. weird. like me and you, we're having a conversation. We're going to have a chat. I'm going to help you. Um, if you feel that, I can get to get you to where you want to go. Then, then great. Let's let's do that deal, and let's let's go together. If not, you know, fine, move on. You see what I'm yeah. saying? The, the PowerPoint. Yeah, it's uh, no to PowerPoint. I don't like yeah. PowerPoint. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing. We're we're kind of going down this tangent, but I I think you, there's no way to build relationships in 2022 and build rapport and kind of have that collaboration if you mm. just present a PowerPoint because you're not in the room physically. You can't see if they're nodding or exactly. looking at their phone or doing something else. So you you're forced through video to have this conversation and have this dialogue even more than you ever were because you're not going to get the opportunity to be physically present. So you have to try to build some level of engagement, rapport, uh, credibility with the, um, your audience through video. And you, know, you can't just read a PowerPoint. You can't slump your shoulders. You can't, you know, be monotone. And, you know, it's the old adage, you know, if you're not excited about what you're saying and selling, how can you possibly expect, you know, the, the audience to be or the customer to be? So that excitement and electricity has to come through the video. Yeah. And if it doesn't, you're missing a trick. So there's no question that being able to present, engage, uh, optimize video channels is, is a core, core capability uh, in 2022 and beyond, because it's, it's the future, yeah. it's today and it's the future. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. And you know, we're also talking about the collaboration with, with, with marketing and sales and how that needs to maybe, you know, come together as we, as we hit, uh, hit, the, hit the road on 2022. And, you know, I'd like to get to, you know, dive into that a bit more. I mean, when we say collaboration, what are we, what are we talking about here? Because, you know, I, I feel that, you know, marketing, you need to create the wants, right? For, for anyone to, for sales to sell something, marketing needs to create that want and that public for, for, for sales to go in and, and start talking to. So when you're talking about, yeah, collaboration, what exactly are, are we talking about here? Are we talking about getting, a, getting the public better defined? Are we talking about in, internal collaboration? I'd like to get your more insights on that. Yeah, all of the above. So I kind of see it as three distinct, you know, circles or or processes as a Venn diagram that all overlap. So certainly, I see marketing and product together as the core, right? The engineering and the product marketing team are building, and then you know, outbound marketing communications are defining the messaging and working on the the TAM total addressable market. 
And that feeds into the sales organization for the prospects. So the prospects being the other you know, key uh, constituent and how that message is being uh, received, uh, how successful it is in what, se in what customer segments, in what regions, in what industries. Uh, those, that's all amazing feedback to get. And then of that, what prospects are actually turning into customers. And so the point is that you really need this virtuous cycle that what's happening in product marketing and marketing is feeding successfully to create prospects and those yeah. prospects are successfully becoming customers. Yeah. Of course, it's not 100%, right? The, the yeah. fail rate is 98% in lead generation, right? You really typically will B2C or B2B. Yeah. You know, you're looking at 30% conversion rate B2B. Once they're lead, you know, probably 2% in B2C. So horrible conversion rate, mostly failure. And the question becomes, why and where and what can we differently? And that's where the connectivity, the connective tissue between sales and marketing has to be there because if they don't see where it's successful and why it's successful, they don't know to put more resource and focus into those success areas. And if, if they don't learn why it's not successful, that's also a huge missed opportunity. Uh, one of my last organizations did B2B sales uh, for $40 billion uh, dollars globally. And one of the most interesting things that we would give back to these large corporations was the reason why we failed. Was it price? Was it product? Was it competition? Mm -hmm. Let them learn from the, the lessons of failure so that marketing and product can iterate and optimize that message going forward. Uh, and they need, if they don't get that feedback, they just think everything is great or they just get frustrated that sales isn't executing. And of course, sales isn't gonna execute. The math is against it. So the question is why and what can we do differently? How can we make different mistakes going forward and let them see and work as a team to iterate the message with data, not just anecdotes, not just, oh, this customer said this or that customer said this, but statistically over hundreds or thousands of engagement points, these are the trends we're seeing. This is the feedback we're getting. What can we do as a team to drive a different outcome. And that's where that partnership is so important. And you mentioned, you mentioned Legion and is, is another way of, of looking at this as well, trying to flip the, flip the coin around or, or flip the scales, right? And go, okay, there's obviously Legion, we need to do outreach, we need to get our public, we need to get them aware. So you do that cycle and you, as you say, you iterate over it. And at a point in time, um, when you've you know got that up and running, you feel it's 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 working as as best it can work. Obviously, it always iterates. You know, there's a there's another uh, I guess terminology out there called demand gen, right? Um, how does this play into what you just mentioned? Is it separate or is it you know intertwined with some of that process that we just gone over? Sure. So certainly demand gen would be you know, farther up the funnel than yeah. the leads that you're able to generate. They're trying to generate demand. And those are very different uh, muscles and dynamics if it's uh, B2C or B2B. Um, so with B2B, hopefully you're driving a quite targeted focus within your total addressable market for your product and your yeah. value and, and who you're trying to hit. You know, with B2C, it's much broader and you know more more uh, of a scattered approach. You want to be as targeted as you can, but because you know consumers is such a, a much larger target, you've got to take a much wider view of, of how you're doing the marketing. But demand gen in B two B, ideally, would be very much aligned with the product market fit and where there's value and where you have other use cases and success stories that can build that momentum. And then again, because demand, then you, you create that, that awareness, right? And lots of times I've, I've gone into organizations and I've seen, you know, there's, there's an issue with sales. Oh, Richard, you know, we aren't converting, okay? Um, then you go, you go up and you look and you go, okay, well, marketing's not really optimized. Then you go up further, you go PR, not really optimized. And, you, and I wonder, okay, well, why are we pointing the finger at sales? I know finally, you know, the, you know, not the buck, but the dollars come through, through the sales department, right? Um, but is there, you know, I believe that there's a tweak to all these different components. You've got to keep on tweaking them, keep on, keep on working them, keep on iterating them. 
and one doesn't work without the other. You mentioned collaboration and connectedness between marketing and sales, but also, I mean, I mentioned demand gen, but that demand gen is ultimately, ultimately PR, right? Um, that also has to be, you know, sort of squeezed into the puzzle, not squeezed in, be part of the puzzle. Because, you know, if your PR or your demand engine is not working, the brand awareness, you know, is not going to be out there. So when you market and when you sell, it's going to be a bit, a bit trickier, right? Absolutely. And I think that goes back to really looking to be data driven and making sure you have the right uh, f uh, filters, analytics, uh, insight into what's actually working and where you're not getting much uh, juice for the squeeze, right? You do a trade show, you do a webinar, and you don't get much flow through. You do a white paper, you don't get much flow through. Okay, well, that's a bad topic, bad distribution method. I mean, learn put a stake in and, and optimize and do it but differently next time. Uh, you know, demand gen, again, is really tough. Uh, you know, there's no perfection in marketing. That's, you know, a little bit of art, a little bit of science. There's no perfection in sales. Um, obviously, sales execution is a big part of, of where the, you know, the buck or the pound or the euro starts and stops. Um, but ultimately, if it's not a product market fit, if you have pricing challenges, if you have competition, those are headwinds that you face. And that feedback of win-loss reason, outcomes needs to go back to the leadership needs to go back to marketing needs to go back to product so you can all you know win or lose as a team understanding what you're facing but you know at the end of the day i believe the sales leaders uh, responsibility is sales execution so you execute yeah. effectively on the opportunities that you have and are given and you drive that to the outcome which in practice should be you know more wins than losses but there are you know, pricing challenges and competitive challenges that you have to fight through, but give that insight back to the firm so they understand they're part of the journey, they're part of the team yeah. to see you know, how it's actually working and it doesn't just become anecdotal or worst case emotional that the sales team isn't good or this is bad and this is like, no, it should all be data-driven and it's all degrees of, of tweaking this multivariate equation between product sales and marketing to optimize the outcome. So we've spoken about components here. We've spoken about PR. We've spoken about marketing. We've spoken about, about sales. What else do um, startup founders or scale-ups need to, what other components are there in this the CRO world that they need to be familiar with uh, and start thinking about in order to, you know, start driving revenue into their business. I know we've mentioned data as also well, outside of those four elements that we've sort of discussed. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a long list. So I guess it's a question of, you know, prior ones, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but there's no question customer success, you know, yeah. that part yeah. of the organization plays a massive role in the learnings and the optimization of what you're doing, you know, on, on many, many folds. Number one, yeah. very tactically reducing churn, you know, keeping yeah. those customers, you know, connected and subscribed or, you know, loyal to you. Uh, number two, driving upsell and cross-sell, right? It's, it's yeah. 10x more cost-effective to drive upsell and cross-sell from the install base uh, than it is to drive new business. And really number three, bringing that voice of the customer back into the firm, right? Back to product, back to marketing, back to sales. Yeah. All of those uh, constituents need to understand what's working well. That makes selling easier. That makes marketing easier. That makes building the product easier. Everybody gets benefit from a, a well-run and connected, uh, thoughtful and engaged customer success team. I cannot you know, say how important that is, especially to a, a scale-up startup company. Uh, to really keep your finger on the pulse. Not everything is going to be perfect, you know, far from it, but you want to listen, you want to understand, you want to react quickly, you want to know when to escalate, and you want to grow so that you don't have that same challenge in a variety of customers uh, down the road. It, it, there's all benefit and no downside to a strong engagement with your customers, no question. And that, that, that engagement with, with customers, because we, we're talking about, you know, we talk about customers a lot of time and that is a connectedness there we, we, we started the, sh the show and we said there's we have to be connected we have to be connected not only with our with our family with our team but also with with our with our customers and it sounds like customer success or our linchpin to being that that connection between you know a a thriving you know sales team and organization to one that maybe is 
a bit off the a bit off the the rails, right? Um, because once you, as you, I like I like what you said. If you engage with your customers, you know their pain points, you know what they're doing, you know where they are, and you can start helping them, right? And if you lose that, there's that you lose that void. Then while well, you're going to potentially lose a customer, and, you know, I'd like you, I'd like to ask you, is an example? I mean, in setting up a customer success team, because I know you've done it from from the ground up a few times in building that. What are some of the the challenges that you faced in bringing in this type of department this type of entity into <laughs> you're smiling into into a company yeah i think all executives and boards now in 2022 believe wholeheartedly in the value of customer success i don't think yeah. there's anyone that doesn't think that's not an important thing you know 10 years ago maybe even you know seven five years ago that wasn't the case i think today it's uh, absolutely ubiquitous as far as it needs to be there. Now the question becomes, how much funding does it get, right? What's the coverage model and how do you measure success in that group? Um, so certainly net promoter score, right? And the capturing and maintenance and um, reporting of the net promoter score is often a key KPI at the executive level. So having that be the, one of their key charter items uh, is vital to, to get that that part of the team stood up yeah. and then having them be responsible for churn, right? Is the other one you want to say, well, if we have this number of customers and this amount of revenue going into the year. We're going to measure and monitor how we end up on those measures at the end of the year. And then no question upsell and cross sell. And, and it becomes a, um, an intelligent, hopefully data-driven discussion about what, well, you know, do I want a sales rep to engage with a customer on a 3000, euro upsell or a 10,000 euro cross sell or do I want a customer success person to do it you know if they're going to go from a 100,000 euro to a 10 million euro mm. customer yeah I probably want outside sales to engage in that but you get a, a degree of you know coverage cost effectiveness to have customer success have some ability to facilitate the growth and the maintenance of those customers and drive revenue so MPS scores uh, reducing churn and being measured on that and then looking potentially at some degree of upsell and cross-sell in a way that fits with the right uh, make model and uh, toolbox skill toolbox of the customer success team that you've hired but i think it's it's pretty ubiquitous at this point richard that everyone agrees that needs to happen it's just do i need three people for five thousand customers or do i need 300 people and how do i measure them and how do i know if they're doing a good job but to that point as well sorry it's also systems right yeah. how are they spending their time how are they looking at you know there's systems like gainsight people can use salesforce or hubspot for some of these things as well you know how am i helping and facilitating that team to do uh, what are called calls to action or other types of engagements that need to happen with a customer based on a quarterly review, based on an NPS score, based on a support ticket, right? How do I connect all the, the tissue as we were just talking about between sales and marketing? How do I connect customer success in with support, in with product management, in with sales? So they all work as one team and one voice for the customer experience. And you, you you took the you took the question right over right over my mouth because there, there's data there's a lot of data that's going to be gathered in, in this process and there's obviously we have to store that data in in some places right so we got PR we got uh, marketing we got sales and now we got customer success and there's this other operational and delivery side of the business but what you, you mentioned Gainsight and HubSpot. What are some of the other um, systems and tools that you guys uh, or you have used um, inside, you know, startup or, or corporate that helps you gather that that data and helps you then, um, you know, as you mentioned, helps you then communicate that data to a uh, to an outside team or even to a to a client at a point in time. Yeah, um, I think the foundational things are that you have an account level view of your customer base and that you're able to manage and store contact information and engagement information. So that can be in any one of the you know, mainstream CRM systems uh, where I think there's an advantage to specialize into a Gainsight or uh, there's no one to Tango that's out in the market. I've had a lot of success with Gainsight. I haven't used other ones. Um, and I think Nick Meta and that team have built really an amazing product uh, in that area. It is that it's really purpose built for the customer success team. Yeah. And it, it thinks and works and has processes for the customer success team. 
um, as opposed to taking what is often a sales system and trying to get the customer success team to use it through customization and extension. Uh, it's really purpose built. I haven't had exposure to Salesforce's uh, uh, functionality in that area, so I can't speak to that, but I have had a lot of ex uh, exposure and experience with Gainsight. And this, you know, Gainsight, TubSpot, you know, these, these type of, of tools then would integrate into operational tools that, you know, the finance, the product guys, the, the other people in the organization or company can pick up and use and understand for whatever their purposes are, right? So again, there's, there's that connected us through, through the business, not only from a sales point of view, but also down into the other elements and other parts of the business, right? Yep, at a very sort of tactical and remedial level, like are they paying their invoices? Do they have a 90 day invoice you know, flag that you have to unfortunately go have a hard conversation with them about on a more strategic and helpful level? Is there a new product release or an upgrade that they should be aware of? Um, or is there a support incident that we resolved or trying to resolve that they need to keep their fingers on, right? The goal is to have them have everything on their dashboard and everything uh, at the tip of their fingers so that they don't have to go make calls and chase people with emails or log into different systems mm -hmm. uh, and to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation, especially in 2022, yeah. where they're not in the office and they can't just walk over to the support desk or to the product yeah. marketing person or to finance. They have to be able to have all those things at their fingertips across you know, disconnected people in different time zones and systems like that provide so much efficiency. Cool. And, you know, as, as we build this up, what, I mean, I'm asked what are the changes, but what are the, what are the realities of, of building up a, not only a, a CRO department of marketing, sales and, and PR engine and also customer success, success engine, what are the realities of, of building up a, a business and scaling it? Because I know you've been through it a few times and it'll be interesting to, to you know, get your insights on that. Yeah, um, a lot of learnings, a lot of uh, mistakes, a lot of best practices, some best practices. I think, you know, one of the big ones uh, most recently with a firm that was, you know, one of the fastest growing in the UK, uh, as flagged by Deloitte, was the critical necessity of revenue operations and that revenue operations really provides that, uh, that neutral uh, body that, that is that connective tissue between the departments that helps an organization grow and scale and stay data driven. Because as it, if you lose that data-driven focus, things become emotional, things become um, uncertain and anecdotal. But revenue operations really connects you know, marketing and, and you know, MQL, CQL, SQL, sorry, lead gen with prospects, with closed sales, with customer success, with support, um, and all the reporting and all the visibility to make sure it, it's all kind of going up and to the right. You know, it, it's going to be stops and starts, and there's going to be plateaus. Yeah. That revenue operations, you know, role, and that's become more and more prevalent, I think, as we saw customer success uh, grow and become a, a standard uh, today, you know, what used to be called sales ops is really revenue ops and spans marketing, spans sales, spans customer success and provides that connective tissue so everybody can understand what's working well, where we have some areas of focus and help drive that remediation and bring actual data and insight up to the C-suite so they can make the right investment decisions and hold the right parties accountable to make sure that we're working as a team as we grow. Because you know that's where it gets tricky as you scale is it doesn't, it's not a straight line, right? There's peaks and valleys and plateaus. And so do we have problems with lead gen? Are we having problems with sales execution? Are we having problems with customer success and retention? Is it the product? Is it marketing? You know, what, who, how? And that's where RevOps should be that neutral uh, repository and insight that everybody can tap into yeah. to see the business and see the health of the business. Because what you don't want, Richard, is marketing saying, oh, I'm, we're creating MQLs and SQLs and there's just no sales execution, right? How are we closing that loop? Hey, that's where we've got to make sure that that uh, lead gen system and the marketing outreach that we have is connected with our CRM system and is connected with our billing system and is connected with our analytics and that that all works as a evolving ecosystem over time. Cool. And, you know, you've worked in corporates and, uh, and startups. And, you know, what would, what's, what's the one bit of advice or, or the three insights you'd like to share with, with those startups and scale-ups out there right now that are, are building a, uh, a marketing department or building a, a sales department or building a customer success department? 
what are the three things that you would say, you know, this is what you're going to get right straight off the bat? Yeah, that's, that's a deep one. Um, I, I would say <laughs> certainly, uh, you know, systems and data, right? I, I sort of see those yeah. differently, but but similar. And, you know, we, we work and bootstrap things and scale-ups and startups, you know, up to a certain point. And the question is, when is that point? And it's almost always too late that we make those, you know, uh, big company or medium-sized company decisions to, to consolidate and clean the sooner you can get those systems of record and the sooner you can have that view of the whole customer life cycle together from demand gen all the way through customer success, the faster you get that insight, I think the more uh, intelligently and, and um, purposefully you'll grow and figure out you know, where you need to focus more attention, more resource or more time from a leadership standpoint. Cause you know, a big part of being a leader is just understanding where you need to apply focus to help it reach its full potential. And if you don't have the data and systems in place to see the customer journey from you know, initial interest all the way through support, you're not gonna have that. So I'd say the sooner you can get that, the better. Um, and then getting those key KPIs across the organization that everyone is measuring and working on. You see companies grow and it's a bit siloed and they're sort of each team is working on what's important to them. And I'm not necessarily necessarily saying this from my personal experience. I'm just saying in general, what I think is important is you know, what's important to product is what's important to marketing is what's important to sales and what's important to customer success and so forth. And everybody can see those metrics that matter and everyone is accountable to that. So you don't have um, people in small and growing organizations with their own unique priorities Mm. where challenges there will have a ripple effect across the organization. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and then I think that the last thing is, is just making sure that you're being agile, right? I think having plans is of course vital and having those KPIs that people are being you know, measured on and we're tracking towards are key, but it's not going to always go to plan, whether it's you know, COVID or you know, inflation or you know, other disruption that we're seeing in the world that's causing headwinds. That what are we going to do? Do we have you know, data and systems in place? We have the right KPIs. How are we going to adjust and tune and refocus to make sure that we're getting to where we need to get to along this journey um, in a coordinated fashion? And by having that purposeful agility, you don't want to be agile for agile's sake, but to have purposeful agility to change what is important and what those priorities are ever so slightly, I think is a critical success component of a, of a scale-up. Yeah, and to add to that, I mean, I, I like to say to my clients, I think, I think what you said there is, is, is sort of very, very accurate. And I like, to, I like to say to my clients, you need to know the data, right? You need to know the data, not only on a, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, on a year, yearly basis, you need to know the data um, on, a, on a weekly basis. And what, what data am I talking about here? You know, you need to know how sales is 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 moving. You need to know how marketing is moving forward. You need to know how product is moving forward. You need to know how, you know, finance is moving forward. All the, the business functions, not just focus on, on one area, i.e. revenue potentially. Um, because once you start looking at the business in totality, you are able to then assign conditions to certain things in certain departments so for example finance for whatever reason may have a really bad invoicing system and they're not collecting any payments so you put them into an emergency condition you say finance in the emergency condition and you as an executive board and as a ceo potentially can then start working to help the finance department sort their shit out right um likewise you might put someone into a part of some department into a power condition. Sales just might be knocking it out the park, power condition. You don't need to worry about it. But the point being that you as a as an executive and CEO, as a founder, can start focusing where you need to focus and not worry about everything, right? It is a, a business that has lots of different uh, legs and lots of different departments. Get the data up, as Dave's saying and understand it, condition it, focus on it, and solve the problem, right? Yeah. And we talked about the importance of customer success, as you sort of said, what's the other key constituent? But you know, I can't echo enough how critical support 
and professional services are to to drive the ecosystem. If if those two you know muscles in the ecosystem are not where they need to be, it's not going to meet its potential. Right, customers are not going to be satisfied because the support is poor. Mm-hmm. If professional services either can't implement what was sold, that's bad sales behavior. They're setting the wrong expectations, or if they can't implement what was sold correctly, but it's not getting hooked up correctly for other challenges, you know, that's a huge problem. So you really have to look at the whole ecosystem and understand health and wellness and, and as you say, critical nature, uh, emergency condition uh, of the patient. But I think those yeah. are two other really, really important um, aspects of a growing organization. Oh, supports later or it's understaffed. We'll do that later. Okay. But you have to do that now. Oh, so services isn't where it needs to be. That's not okay to just have sales and not have services. And it, it's not that that's the case but that whole system has to flourish. And those are all key, key constituents to, to reach your full potential in a scale-up. And it's, you mentioned system. There are three things in part of, as a part of this system that's, that you describe, and there are people, processes, and tech, mm-hmm. right? And all three of those elements need to be you know, firing in all cylinders for you as founders and executives to really unlock your your hidden profits right if one is blocked well you know your your scaling journey is going to be blocked if all of them are blocked you're going to be blocked but if all of them are firing then you know you're going to be you're going to be scaling up and and wanting to and going to achieving your your sort of desired outcome right um i think you you mentioned a a really interesting point you mentioned health and wellness and and what have you but you know that is interesting and it's interesting because the purpose of the company needs to be sort of embedded into the p- employees, right? And the team, everyone needs to be living and breathing this. And we can't leave health and wellness or IE culture on the side, just as we can't leave support on the side, just as we can't leave professional services on the side. If you want your people uh, to really be uh, in it, then create a company that uh, people want to be be involved uh, I, I had a, a recent guest on my show from uh, from Vigi from from the Netherlands and uh, he mentioned that over the last six uh, over the last two months at the back end of 2021 him and his executive team were discussing and trying to answer one question and one question only which I thought this question I thought is is very interesting um, And it was this, it's how do we make certain that our team right now today will stay with us for the rest of their lives? And I I, I looked at him and I said, that's that's amazing because everyone else in the world is asking asking something else. They're saying, or telling me something else. There's no talent. I can't find anyone. And they they flipped the scales of this. And they're asking that question. Why are they asking that question? Because they have strong purpose. They have a strong culture. They trust each other. They trust the team, right? So, you know, um, we can't leave parts of the system out to the side at the start. They need to be fully integrated to what you were saying, Dave, at the beginning. And they just need to build, be built up and iterated over the course of time, over the course of the journey. Absolutely. No, there's no uh, no question. There's, you know, people like Simon Sinek. I'm not necessarily a fan of his. Not working, but you know, you've got to figure out what, your why, and you've got to make sure you're focusing on yourself and your team. And I think that the big thing in 2022, continuing from 21, is empathy. Right? You have yeah. to really understand and listen to a degree. I think there is a much more of a, you know, shut up and take it and get it done. You know, pre 2020, and I think 2021 and beyond it's now you know be much more attuned and listening and empathetic to people's journey and their life and well-being and how they're living and i think that's a a big part of of the world going forward which is great and it's just different and you better get on that train because it's left the station so um it's exciting and um listen as we as we as we wrap up this part of the uh this part of the show is there any oh dave's disappeared (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is, is there any other tips or, or bits of advice that, that you want to give to startup founders or, or scale-ups out there that, uh, that you think is important for them to, 
to know and, and understand as they continue on their journey? I mean, I think we've hit most of the points. I, you know, it's, it's a hard journey, right? It takes the whole ecosystem. Obviously, sales is a, a critical component of the execution part of it, but from product to marketing to customer success to support to professional services, right? The whole org needs to be dialed in on, on what's working and what not working, not what's not working. And sales is 100% accountable for sales execution. And that's critical, but it's really, do, can you see the whole ecosystem, right? Can you see the health and wellness of all the other parts? If not, why? And if not, now, when, right? Because that's a key maturity step in getting a much better handle on where you should be prioritizing your time to help the company reach its full potential. Okay, cool. And now we go into the fun part of the show. I'm not saying that uh, wasn't uh, fun talking about uh, what we just spoken about, because it was. Uh, but it's called the flash round. Everyone knows what the flash round is. It's a bit of uh, fun at the end. Uh, it gives you a bit of insights as to who Dave is and what he does. And uh, then we flip over the chair and the microphone, and Dave asks me a question. So here we go. Um, quick answers. There's, there's three questions. They have you know, just simple one-word answers. We don't need to rabble on about stuff. Uh, so here we go. So first one for you, Dave, corporate or startup? Both. Oh, boo. <laughs> <laughs> face to face or Zoom? Oh, face to face all day, face to face. Is brand important in tech? Personal, is br a personal brand important in tech? Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's a, that's a, des that's a journey, not a destination, right? Cause it evolves, but it, it's very, very important. Brilliant. Okay. Now your turn to ask me a question. I know you've uh, been, been wanting to ask me one for years. So here it is. Here's the chance. <laughs> What's your favorite part of living in the UK? Oh my gosh. Aspect. So my family, yeah, there we go. So that, that, that's, that's easy. I've got a great, uh, I've got a great family. I've got, I've got a beautiful wife uh, and I've got two brilliant kids and uh, I've got a really, ni really nice in-laws and, and family around that are, are just brilliant. So, brilliant. so that's, that's the best part. I can't say the weather because the weather is absolutely abysmal. Um, but yeah, family close by, having a, having a great life and a great time with them on the tennis courts, etc. So uh, yeah, that, that was an easy question, man. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, Dave, it's been awesome having you on the show today and uh, really looking forward to your next step in, in your journey. I know where you're going. I'm not going to spoil it by, by, by mentioning it here, but uh, if you look behind Dave on uh, the, his left-hand shoulder, there's, there's a sign, uh, he's just put his head there. And, uh, you know, he's going to be going in and, and doing some cool stuff uh, in the next part of this year. Looking forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks so much for coming on the show and, and really, you know, giving us some insights as to what it takes to, to start building, because it is building a, a, a business development function uh, and customer success department that really allows a, a team to be connected, not only internally, but also externally with clients. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, looking forward to getting this out there and uh, looking forward to, you know, seeing your success over the coming years, mate. Thanks, Richard. Big fan of the podcast. You've done great work and really excited to be part of it. So thanks for having me on.